Good morning, IPC Hebron. Praise God. The Lord has been with us. And uh, I can feel it in the spirit. Um, and I thank the Lord for the way he is moving among us. Amen. Today we will be talking about uh, Moses as we look unto Jesus. Moses as we look unto Jesus. And we're trying something for the first time, which was trying to do keynote. Uh, and uh, I think the connection just left. So if you wanted to fix it, thank you. So Moses points us to Jesus Christ, the great redeemer. Moses points us to Jesus Christ, our great redeemer. And so one of the most important prominent leaders, human leaders that are born into this world, arguably the epitome of selfless leadership apart from Christ, is an Israelite slave born to a couple named Amram and Jochebed. His name is Moses. From Bible uh, school, from uh, Sunday school, uh, Christian education, we're really familiar with Moses, right? If you ask any Jewish person, they will tell you that he was the greatest liberator the world has ever seen. Amen. In Numbers 12, verse 3, it says that Moses was the meekest man on earth. He is the only person that the Old Testament describes this way. So how did this meek man not enter into the promised land? How did he uh, not enter into the promised land? So we need to study this closely. But in the Gospels, we also see that Jesus Christ um, is exemplifying meekness, living it out perfectly, emptying himself. He carried out the Father's will left all of his heavenly glories above and came down and lived a perfect life for 33 and a half years, died on the sin for our, died for our sins on the cross, and he rose again, and he is the greatest liberator of all of mankind. We see that he was able to take away sin, the power of death, and we have the victory through Jesus Christ. You know, when we study the Old Testament, we must always remember that the stories uh, of the Old Testament are not just plain stories, but they point to Christ. Everything in the Bible points to Christ, whether it is in types or shadows. And today, last few weeks, we've been studying about Abel, Noah, and last week, Joe touched on Joseph. And today, we will talk about Moses. You know, the t uh, name Moses, Moshe, it means to draw out of the water. And so it also means deliverer. And it's associated with some divine intervention, leadership, and liberation. So Moses was born in a time where uh, there needed to be a leader. We know that uh, at the start of the Bible, after creation, Adam and Eve sinned. And we know about the flood of Noah. And we know about the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, and uh, we know about Joseph and the 12 tribes. And the gap between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus is thought to be a few hundred years, right? And so we are now moving on to the Mosaic age uh, of the time of Moses. And in Exodus chapter 1, we start to talk about the time uh, that Moses was born. We see that the Israelites were in Egypt for about 430 years total. And out of that 400 years or so, they were under bondage or slavery. It might have started out with small types of slavery, uh, but at the end, it was hard, hard labor because people did not know Joseph and what he had done for their country. And such a time as this is when this liberator named Moses was born. And we will study a little bit more about Moses and how that is pointing to Christ. The key verse today is from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 to 28. If you would turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 onwards. By faith, Moses, when he was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful 
and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Here it is talking about the faith of Moses' parents. I thank God for such parents that have faith that was not afraid of the king's edict and was willing to hide him. Even though the edict of the land said that all Hebrew boys must die, they saw something peculiar in their son. He was a beautiful child. And in some other portions, we saw that he was a proper child. They saw the destiny within Moses, and they named him uh, Moses, right? Uh, so we see that, that the parents have a big role in the faith of the next generation. Amen. Amen. We will see a little bit more about that, where the mother became the nurse of Moses after Moses was put out into the Nile. And we know that the Pharaoh's daughter picked him up, and, uh, but we see Miriam arranging for the mother to be the nurse. And every time I believe she was feeding him, she was telling about how he is a Hebrew uh, and, and how he needs to follow the Lord, ways of the Lord. And he was, she was teaching them, uh, uh, teaching him in particular what he was and what he is not. Even though Moses was living in the laps of luxury as the next prince of Egypt, there were a few things that I learned that about this. Uh, we know that Pharaoh only had daughters. And so really Moses was supposed to be the next king or Pharaoh. Uh, and we see that he was truly uh, going to be that leader. So he had all of this wealth, all of this power, all of this prestige. And we know that his parents thought that he was a beautiful child, a proper child. He had the brawn, the beauty, and the brains all together together. Uh, and he, by faith, verse 24 says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, made a choice. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Children of God, we live in Egypt, which is the world. We have a choice daily. We have a choice in our life, whether we will choose to be called part of this world or rather be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of this world. Amen. He considered the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth, than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking towards that heavenly reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Moses had seen, and from his teaching of his mother, knew that he was uh, set apart for a different destiny. And we see that he left. He goes dark. He goes, uh, and he is seen no more for 40 years. And that is so hard when you have all the things in the world for the first 40 years of your life. He left Egypt. He was not afraid of angering the king. And he endured uh, for something greater, far greater. And then we go on to see, and we'll look at this in different ways. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer, the firstborn, might not touch him. That is symbolic of what is taking place with our Lord Jesus Christ who became once and for all the perfect Passover lamb, that he became the, the redeemer of all of mankind. But by faith, he kept the Passover, and uh, thus he was able to save the people of Israel and bring them out in this exodus. Uh, and then by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea onto dry land, but the enemies, the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, it says they were drowned. Amen. So if we were to split Moses' years into uh, three periods of 40, uh, we're familiar with this thought, but I was uh, reading what D.L. Moody, the great scholar, uh, the, uh, uh, preacher said, the first 40 years, he was thinking he was a somebody. The next 40 years, he was learning that he was a nobody. And the final 40 years... God was showing through him what he can do with a nobody. Amen. And that's attributed to D.L. Moody. So let's look back at the stage of Moses' life. And this is applicable to all because we all have to make choices in our life. 
We may have the greatest status. If you look at Exodus and Acts and Hebrews and Corinthians and study it all together, uh, you will see that he was a proper child. We see he was handsome. So a dashing good looks, but also the proper child could mean many things that they saw something very peculiar in him. They knew that Abraham, their forefather, was promised that after 400 years or four generations, they would have a, a liberator. And I don't know if uh, Jochebed and Amram saw this in the life of Moses. But we see that their parents were instrumental in saving his life. He was learned the best of education, the peak of civilization was in Egypt at that time. And Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, also says that he was a mighty in battle. He led a battle against um, another country, Ethiopia, I want to say, and he was able to gain great victory and, uh, great, uh, and win. He was a leader. He was a communicator. He was a warrior. He had all the monies. He was raised in the royal courts. He was set to be the next prince, uh, next pharaoh, as he was the prince of Egypt, and there were no male descendants in his next generation. So uh, pharaoh, the next pharaoh could have been Moses, um, and we know that Moses had it all. Moses had it all. And the easiest choice was to do nothing. If you look at choices, uh, we usually have to weigh the pluses and minuses and pick something better, right? If you look in the short term, Moses would have to give up everything, including all the power and prestige, all the wealth that he had. And he was looking at the long term, and he, as we read, was looking for the invisible God. Amen. We also see another pearl that his birth mom was the one who taught him his identity. As she was feeding him, she was speaking into his ear that he is a Hebrew He's different, and I believe with time that uh, took hold of his life. And even though he saw all the uh, inequalities that were taking place, he kept this in his mind, and we, he knew that he was born to be something different. And in order to do that, he had to spurn it all. We see that even though he goes out and tries to liberate, that's not the way God intended, and uh, he had to run off. He had to go off the grid and he was suffering. He was in a desolate place called Midian and that he became a shepherd to his father-in-law. We see that he had to choose people of God. Uh, he had to choose with his spiritual eyes and say no to the pleasures and the luxuries of Egypt. He had to make a decision to disappear to reach his destiny. And what we see over and over stated is that he had faith and God developed him into a masterpiece. The Bible in the New and the Old Testament mentions him 852 times and we even see him in the Mount of Transfiguration and many times in the New Testament. This Moses, who I've gone over the early life here, is a shadow of the Christ that is predicted. And we see in the Word of God that Jesus is the new greater Moses. And in the New Testament, the imagery is very clear. If you look at Jesus explaining on the road to Emmaus after he's resurrected, you see him talking about how on the road to, uh, how he is mentioned in the writings of Moses. We see in Stephen's sermon, we see in the writings of Peter and Paul that Jesus is the new prophet who establishes a new covenant, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. And so if you look at the Bible, you'll see many similarities. If you look at it superficially, you can see that both were pres preserved in childhood. Both had to contend uh, with masters of evil. They fasted 40 days each. Both were able to control the sea. Both fed the multitudes. Both had radiant faces. Both had endured murmurings within their family. Both were discredited at home. But let's look at it a little bit more in detail. If you look at the life of Moses and Jesus, you'll see that the Pharaoh tried to kill him as a baby, as Jesus had Herod try to kill him as a baby. 
And therefore both of them were hidden and both of them went into Egypt for uh, their survival. And we see that Moses was rejected by his Hebrew uh, kinsmen initially. And then we know that the Jews rejected Christ who he came for first. There were long periods of silence from childhood to adulthood. We know that early on Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter the prince, and he became the prince of Egypt. But we know that Jesus was adopted by uh, Joseph and he was the son of God. We see uh, Moses going from being a prince to a pauper. Uh, in the first 40 years, he had everything you could ask for. And the next 40, he had to be off the grid and he was uh, uh, not heard from until the burning bush. And we see that for God uh, sent his only begotten son uh, down into the world and he, he uh, left all his heavenly glories above and came into the world and that was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Moses was a shepherd to his father-in-law Jethro and we see that the word of God says Jesus is a good shepherd. Amen. Both fasted 40 days, Moses on Mount Sinai and we see that Jesus fasted uh, in the desert when he was tempted of the devil. We know both of them were Hebrew. We know Moses was in the tribe of Levi and Jesus in the tribe of Judah, the line of Judah. Both were discredited at home. We see that because of his marriage, we see his brother and sister, uh, uh, sister in particular, uh, making fun of him, right? Um, and we see that both the brother and sister of Jesus was also discrediting him initially and did not believe him. And we see that Moses is known for his meekness as a man of meekness. As I read Numbers 12 verse 3 that said he was uh, more meek than anybody on earth. And we know that Jesus Christ is the uh, epitome of meekness. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and came down into the earth and washed the servant's feet. And he became the epitome of servant leadership and meekness that we see in Moses. We see the mission of Moses to be to redeem Israel from the slavery of Egypt. So he was supposed to be a liberator for a certain period of time for the Jewish people. But we know that the mission of Jesus is to redeem mankind from the slavery of sin once and for all. And that he gave his life and that Jesus accomplished his mission redeeming us as the savior of the world. We see that uh, both of them got the approval in an audible voice in Sinai for Moses and we see after the baptism in Jesus. We see Moses was willing to give his life for his people. Many times when God was so angry with them, he said, kill me instead. But we know that Jesus really went through with it and was willing to die on the cross for all of mankind. Moses is a prophet of the old covenant of the law, but we know Jesus comes not to destroy the old covenant, but to say that I am the completion of that covenant and establishing a new and everlasting covenant. Jesus paid it all once and for all, shedding his own blood. Everyone who believes on him has a right to be children of God. Amen. If you look back, there is a symbolic picture of this. We see that at the 10th plague, when the firstborn was being killed, we see that the Passover lamb was sacrificed and the blood was put on the doorposts and the lentils. And we see that because of that, the destroyer passed over the house of the Israelites and they were able to be saved and they started their exodus into the promised land. But we see that Jesus uh, released us permanently from the slavery of sin as we read in Romans 8 verse 2. And as the Jewish people yearly have a festival of Passover, we have a festival weekly of a holy communion in remembrance of the Lord's death and the victory until he returns. And so Jesus became the Pascal lamb once and for all, for all of mankind, and that is foreshadowed in the life and the story of Moses. As I mentioned, Moshe means to draw out or rescue out of the water. And there was destiny in the name of Moses. Uh, and Yeshua, Jesus also means 
God saves. And so there were destiny in both of their names. We also read in the New Testament, Hebrews 3, that Moses was faithful in his house, which is the house of Israel. And we see that Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him and became the savior of all of mankind. We see Moses refusing to worship false gods and got so angry that he crushed or broke uh, the Ten Commandments when he saw the golden calf. And we see Jesus refusing to worship or bow down to Satan in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. We see there were about 400 years out of the 430 uh, that was in slavery. And we see about a 400-year gap between Malachi and Jesus coming. There were also uh, prophecies concerning uh, the coming Messiah. And uh, we see Moses saying, there will be someone coming just like me. And we see Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus in the New Testament, in the road to Emmaus, after he's been resurrected, on the same day, he's walking with two of his disciples about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking to each other, and we see Jesus say something, how foolish are you, how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning him. So we see how Moses was always prophetically talking about Jesus and the Messiah that would come. A greater Messiah from your household that would come. And we would see that in many portions of the Old Testament. We also see uh, that Moses appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration uh, when Jesus took his most beloved disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to the hill. And therefore, he trans uh, there he transfigured before them. And we see that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And Jesus then there appeared them before them, Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So uh, we see that, um, uh, that in the transfiguration, there is Moses as well. So Moses is one of those people uh, that though he had died, he continues uh, to live eternally. Uh, with, with our Father. He, though he did not reach the promised land, we believe he is in uh, heaven. So the brazen serpent on the pole is a clear typology again of the serving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We see that uh, it takes us back to the Garden of Eden and we see the first sin of Adam and Eve, how the serpent, uh, the serpent of old deceived them and there needed to be a solution as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, as it says in John 3, 14, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So we see Moses again here in this uh, verses right before the most famous verse of John 3, 16, uh, coming as this is explained, that the punishment of sin brought into the world through the temptation of the serpent of old was laid upon Jesus, and he has won the victory, and he has crushed his head once and forever. Moses is that prototype of the Lord Jesus. There is a new prophet like Moses. Uh, there's a new prophet to come, Moses said in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, there is uh, a new prophet that I will raise up among you, among your brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak of all of them that I will command. So Moses was prophesying uh, thousands of years before about the coming of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, as we see in Deuteronomy 18. In Acts 3.22, we see Peter telling the Jews that, 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 as Moses said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet from among you. So he was quoting Deuteronomy 18. Again, in Acts 7, we see Stephen uh, in a sermon that got him killed, bringing up uh, Moses' words to explain Jesus as the Messiah. In Luke 24, in the road to Emmaus, we see that Moses and the law of Moses is brought in. And again, in Philip's testimony, uh, in the book of John, chapter 1 and chapter 5, we see that we have found the one written off by Moses. So Moses prophetically was talking about the Messiah, which was fulfilled in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul also claimed that Moses 
predicted Jesus and his divine authority to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And in Rome, again, at the very end of his life, Paul, again, used Moses to convince others uh, about our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, hopefully you've seen by this parallel study that Moses uh, was always pointing to a greater Messiah uh, coming, uh, a Messiah coming once and for all, and that would be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, in Hebrews chapter 3, we see uh, this particular portion, and as the uh, worship team is coming up and I'm concluding, I want to make sure I explain this well. So we see that Moses was not able to enter the promised land. Even though he was a great, great leader, he was not able to enter the promised land. Why? Because he struck the rock twice, right? We see that in Exodus 17, when they were in a place and the people were grumbling, the Lord told them to strike the rock, and we see that waters came out from that place. But again, in Numbers 20, we see that the, again the people were grumbling, and Moses was mad at the people, and Jesus uh, uh, and God told him uh, to speak to the rock. And instead, we see that Moses hits the rock twice. In that disobedience, as we pastor has been talking about, he lost his ability to enter the promised land. His disobedience became a hindrance to the promised land. And we see that that has a greater meaning. What does that mean? As we were thinking about it, and we discussed it a little bit in Sunday school as well, we see that Jesus Christ, once and for all, once and for all, has died for the sin of mankind. And he has been beaten once. There is no need to beat him again. But all you need to do is openly confess your sins. If you study the end of, book, of the book Hebrews and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and Hebrews 7 and all of the book of Hebrews essentially, you will see an admonishment when we look at the life of Moses. While there is great success, he was meek. He was not able to enter the promised land. And that remains a lesson for all of us that even though he was faithful in all of God's house, he at the very end became disobedient. And instead of trusting in the finished work of Christ, he started, tried to implement works and he tried to beat the rock again in disobedience to God. And I believe it serves as a reminder to all of us that we need to be faithful until the very end of our life. The warning is there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that we should be faithful and that we should be careful not to fall away. And that is my humble request for all of us that even though we think we're a great leader, we think we are accomplishing great things for the Lord, even though we think we're faithful before the Lord, let us be careful that we are obedient to Christ in every aspect of our life. Because Jesus is greater than Moses and he is faithful over God's house as a son and a, and a house is not more important than the builder of the house. Let us hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in the Lord Jesus and him crucified alone. Not any of our merits, not any of our works, but it is only the Lord Jesus and the work he has done. We don't need to beat the rock again, the rock that was with him throughout the desert. Jesus was that rock, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Jesus was that rock that was with them and he was beaten once and for all and he died on the cross of Calvary and he gained the victory for us. So when we do mess up as we do before we take part in the Lord's table, 
let us confess with our mouth that Lord I have fallen and I need to get back to you may God bless you all with these words we all stand together